Well, good evening and welcome back to the Journey Home program. I'm your host, John Mark Grodi. And once again, we have this great privilege here on EWTN to hear a story, a testimony, uh, the gospel uh, writ large in someone's life. And tonight we're joined by David Dean. He's a former Presbyterian and is now the superintendent of Catholic schools for the Diocese of Tulsa. Uh, David, thanks so much for joining us tonight. Thank you, John Mark. It's great to be here. It's great to have you. Uh, I'm excited yeah. to hear your story. Again, you're the superintendent of Catholic schools and yes. education and language fi figure yes. a lot into your story. We were just talking about it beforehand. Yes, um, I've, I've been blessed um, entering into the church and, and God has been good yeah. and, and taking care of, of me and, and our, our family and over the years and uh, often when I didn't deserve it. <laughs> Amen, <laughs> <So>. <laughs> brother. <laughs> well, I'm excited yeah. to hear it. So let's go back to the beginning. Where, where does your spiritual journey begin? Well, I, I was, grew up in Hutchison, Kansas. I was reared in the first Presbyterian church there in Hutchison. Uh, my parents were, I would say, devout Presbyterians. We uh, went to service every Sunday morning. I went to Sunday schools as a young boy. Uh, sometimes against my will, <laughs> and uh, but they they uh, were adamant that that we attend. And so, uh, my father was in the choir. He had a, a beautiful tenor voice. I was to find out later that uh, he grew up in Omaha, which is a very Catholic city, and he, he had such a great voice that the Catholics would act, actually ask him to come sing at some of the masses. <laughs> Unfortunately, he never converted, but um, so what happened was I, I grew up in that world, my father uh, with his voice. I grew up around classical music, um, Handel's Messiah. He could knock out the tenor part, you know, the Alleluia chorus and often did in the house. And so that was the ambiance in, in which I was sort of nurtured. Yeah. And then the, as I get to high school in the, the late 60s, and early 70s, um, I go down the road, probably a lot of young people did in that time, and got into rock and roll, right? Sure. And uh, so, Jimi Hendrix and Led Zeppelin and all those wonderful uh, types of bands were became, you know, I became enamored of them. So I went off to KU where I had found uh, a humanities program. Uh, I really didn't have a complete knowledge of just what it, what I was in for at the time. But it was essentially a great books program, though the professors would, would maybe deny that a little bit, but it's certainly an integrated humanities program. And I, I went up, I think, as a typical freshman. I was 17 at University of Kansas. Uh, it was the age of drugs, sex, and rock and roll on campus. Um, a lot of long hair, or in my case, an afro. <laughs> uh, my hair's not so blonde anymore, but I'm I... trying to visualize it. I had a huge <laughs> afro. Uh, my father, who detested it, mm. said I look like a dandelion gone to bloom. <laughs> and it was not a compliment. So um, I went up and sort of led the, the college lifestyle, if you will, that a lot of young people led in those days. And I hope not, but I maybe do some degree today, right? Yeah. So I started attending this humanities program, which were these these uh, kind of conversations around all these these great classics of, of Western civilization. And at one point then, I went ahead and enrolled into a, a Latin class. Um, didn't really have any desire to take Latin, but I had started with a Spanish class and it wasn't, uh, I didn't like it, didn't like the teacher and so forth. So a good, uh, my roommate at the time convinced me to, to enroll in Latin class, which was taught by Dr. Senior, uh, one of the professors of the program, um, who obviously uh, it, it went well with the program itself, and so it was like a, a part of it. And so I did that for two years. I also lived in a fraternity, and uh, that was not an edifying lifestyle. <laughs> had and, you, at, up to this point, had you sort of fallen away from your faith? Were you still sort of vaguely practicing, or where, where were you with God at this point? Well, when I went to KU, of course, I stopped going to church. I did not go to First Presbyterian Church okay. in Lawrence. Yeah, um, I had had right about that time some qualms with the church. I, I do want to say, mm. I believe it was a great foundation for me. And, and my father particularly was a very good example as a Christian man, so I want to make that very clear. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but as I matured, you know, and laid into high school, um, I noticed sometimes like we, we would stand up, I think it was the doxology when they brought the money in. It was one of the few times in the service we stood up. And I, 
maybe in this idealistic teenager, I thought, well, that's kind of weird. <laughs> Why would you stand up for the money, right? <laughs> um, but overall, I think it was a very good uh, sort of foundation for me. But I, yes, to answer your question, I went to KU. Um, I did not go to church anymore. So I went through about two years, which was the duration of the program. And I began to sense a void in my life. Um, I think, you know, due to the the good upbringing I had at home and for my family. And so I started looking at churches, but guess which one was the only one I re- didn't look at? <laughs> the Catholic Church, right? Yeah. I, I, really, I really did. I went to like seven or eight in Lawrence. And um, about the same time when, we, when I finished this humanities program, I went to Dr. Senior, one of the three professors, and I said, Dr. Senior, I want to know, you three men, you are not telling us something. What is it? <laughs> he goes, well, I can't tell you that. I'm like, oh, yes, you can. This is, you have academic freedom. Tell me what's going on here. And the answer I never expected to hear was, well, we're all three Catholic. Mm-hmm. And I think probably you know, my, my jaw, the equivalent of hitting the table, and it was stunned for a moment, and I said, well, how, then how can I find out more? Yeah. And it turns out he was sort of teaching a little class off campus. Mm. Um, you know, be very careful, because it's a public university. Yeah. You can't teach Catholicism or, or Jesus or anything, right, right. In, in, in that milieu. So, What was your impression of Catholicism up to this point? I really had no contact with it. I, I did not grow up so with not any... not negative or anything? Just, no. It's just out there? No, my I said my father was very very good Christian man. He yeah. he he didn't like the Catholic Church. I found out later, but okay. he never imbued that into me somehow. You know, he he never projected that onto me in any way. And so, no, I was I guess pretty open minded about it. I I just thought Catholics were strange. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, a lot of that when I first finally did go to my my roommate. Uh, now, by the way, he's a, a monk at Clear Creek Monastery just wow. outside of Tulsa. <laughs> Um, he's the one who encouraged me to, to come, and I kept putting him off. And I remember my first impression was all this up and down stuff and, you know, the sign of the cross seemed very foreign to me. Um, I don't think there was any incense at that particular mass, but nonetheless, it was a very strange thing. And I, and I wasn't like, okay, I'm never going to do this, but, you know, I, I didn't go back in a short amount of time, I just sort of took it in. Yeah. Um, but I was shopping, and I went to First Presbyterian Church in Lawrence, and so I, thought I, didn't, I did not want to be there, mm-hmm. uh, just given who the pastor was and so forth, and some of the things that happened in, yeah. in the confines of the service. But I did have, I believe, a moment um, that God reached out to me, and I didn't realize it until years later. He sort of touched me. Uh, with a Latin class, they had a, a, a Vespers at the St. Lawrence Center there, you know, the Catholic Church in Lawrence, mm-hmm. uh, like at five o'clock. And they would chant, the, you know, in Latin, the Vespers. And again, my roommate convinced me to come attend this. And I was very pragmatic about it. I thought, well, this is good because it's going to help me in my Latin and I'll get a better grade, <laughs> right? Had nothing spiritual attached to it, believe me. So I went once, and despite all the great classical music I'd heard as a child in my own home, I'd never heard Gregorian chant. And I walked in again, I was just stunned. I think I just stood there for a moment, and my roommate had said, okay, you can come on in and sit down now. <laughs> and. I didn't know it, but I think that was the beginning of my conversion. And I think what it was, it was beauty. Hmm. I had encountered something beautiful, something much more profound and beautiful than the pop culture of which I had become a great fan. You know, Led Zeppelin and Jimi Hendrix, who I thought were almost godlike, right, a, a year or two before. Um, all of a sudden, God really touched me there. Unfortunately, I'm the sort of person that God has to use a two-by-four. 
Uh, the beautiful moments are beautiful, but I needed a couple more touches yeah. upside the head. Um, but I really think that was a, a moment in my conver you know, conversion and, and not knowing it. So I, uh, I then started to attend some inf informative type sessions about the Catholic Church, mostly taught by Dr. Senior off campus, oh, as I said. Class, yeah. mm -hmm. Turns out there were a lot of young people there. Mm -hmm. Uh, maybe 20 or 30. It was in someone's house after hours, so he didn't have the conflict of, you know, with the university. Yeah. And that took about a year and a half of, you know, prayer and I, uh, a lot of thought and study. And he's a great teacher, of course, so he, he made it very compelling in his own way. Um, and then I realized at some point I had to go tell my family. Hmm. And I would like to say this to, to a lot of people who might be listening mm -hmm. out there. I believe it's important to have that conversation with your family. I know it's hard. Uh, my father was not excited about it mm -hmm. uh, when I finally told him. He was, I think, quite upset, actually. And so we had quite a few discussions um, over maybe a period of six months or so. And uh, at one point, he asked me if I would go meet with our pastor at First Presbyterian there in Hutchison. And, you know, out of respect for my father, I did that. And I was nervous, right? I was thinking, I'm, I'm entertaining this notion of coming to the Catholic Church and I have to talk about it with my own father, but I'm not well-versed in apologetics. I'm not well-versed in church yeah. teaching. I haven't read the you know, through catechisms at any great length. If I mean, what if what if this pastor, my former pastor, begins to convince me otherwise or something, right? And so it, it was it was really difficult. But I did finally. Um, I I went before I converted. I went and met with him, and we talked for about an hour, an hour and a half. And I I thought it pretty well. He you know he posited some arguments that I he he was very gentle in a yeah. sense. He that I should consider or think about, and I did my best to respond, of course. And so um, I came home, and then I talked to my mom and dad, but took with my father about it, and I, I think he was a little disappointed um, that the, our pastor didn't come on a little stronger or something, yeah. you know, <laughs> a tougher defense of, you know, the Presbyterian Church. But uh, then shortly thereafter, it was, that Christmas, right before Christmas, I converted in mm -hmm. um, 75, 1975 in the oh. church. And then through Dr. Senior was my godfather. And my, uh, my friend, my roommate, who helped spur me along through this whole process, who's yeah. now the monk at Clear Creek, uh, he came along as well. Wow. And um, so it, 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 was, it was a good journey for me, but I, I feel like it, it's a journey that built, you know, I, uh, on a foundation, my, my Presbyterian foundation. Mm -hmm. Um, and then taking it, you know, to another level with the Catholic Church. Yeah. Now let's. I mean, let, let's back up a little bit because this this uh, program mm -hmm. that you encountered and these professors and even this mm -hmm. course off campus, it's a bit of a phenomenon in terms of the impact it was having. Yes. You know, what were some of the things that you? I wanted to. I, I forgot to ask earlier. Mm -hmm. What caused you to initially ask that question of like, what's going on with these three professors? What were? Mm -hmm. What was intriguing to you that sort of prompted that that inquiry? Well, now I would call it the kind of the philosophy of Perennis uh, that, that lies behind Western great works in Western civilization. So if you're reading Homer or Virgil, uh, Sophocles and Cicero, and obviously they're not Christian. Uh, and then as you move on in the uh, St. Augustine, you know, the fall of the Roman Empire or Boethius and and then on in the Middle Ages, obviously, then it becomes more Catholic, at least with Aquinas and, and other great you know, writers. And then in the modern era, we, of course, we read Shakespeare, and, and I know there's a lot of discussion whether he's really Catholic or not. I read <laughs> Joseph Pierce's book, you know, about yeah. that. So it's, it's very enticing. Uh, I want to believe that, right? Yeah. Um, but certainly some modern authors were clearly were not uh, Catholic at all. And so this philosophy of Perennis, I guess I would call it, is that there were these underlying themes, of, you know, kind of the transcendental themes of goodness and truth and beauty that these three professors so beautifully, and I would say poetically, brought out of the Iliad, the Odyssey, and the Aeneid, and Consolation of Philosophy, or the Confessions, and all these great texts. 
And so that's what prompted me at some at the end of the program, which was two years, uh, at the end of my sophomore year, to, to go to Dr. Senior, because he's the one I knew the best, and say, what are you not telling us? Yeah. There has to be more here. And so that's really what did it. And I, and I think what's just good for people to realize, too, is this is in a very secular environment, right. mostly done with secular texts, with one or two exceptions, maybe Augustine's Confessions, a few selections from the Bible. Uh, but other than that, all completely secular text. And so we, we see God's love and his beauty and his truth shine through his creation. St. Paul says very eloquently, one yeah. of his letters, we really have no excuse not to believe if, if we look at creation. And of course, these are sort of beautiful spotlights or highlights of creation, these particular texts. And so they bring us in their own way to a more fundamental truth. Mm -hmm. And I think it's logically you can look at it. So if the, if the arm has a purpose in the body, right, and we know the hand has a purpose in the body, then doesn't the whole body have a purpose? And if, in fact, the whole body does have a purpose, then what is that purpose? And is there someone behind that purpose? Or yeah. did it happen by accident, as we know mm -hmm. many people today claim and you know, hold on to that? Theory. So, yeah, I think seeing all these beautiful, beautiful things uh, within these texts and behind them, and wh what does this mean, right? And and I think to put it in a word, it's it's creating that sense of wonder. Yeah. And and that's I feel is so important, even you know, even today in our culture, especially with young people, creating that sense of wonder, and that takes one has to be silent. For a while to to really immerse themselves in, into wonder. Um, I love you know Cardinal Sarah's book. You know, yeah. the power of silence. I mean, what a wonderful title, mm -hmm. <laughs> and and what a beautiful book too. Mm -hmm. Highly recommend that one. Yeah, if anyone has not read it, but how profound that is um, that we, that we even through a simple poem, you know. In this program, we would memorize about 10 poems a semester. Wow. And some of them were quite lengthy. And we did it orally. So we, did, we could not have a piece of paper in front of us with a poem on it and take it home and re recite it to ourselves. We did it orally. A uh, teacher would repeat the words. And so think like William Wordsworth, you know, the world is too much with us late and soon. And we'd repeat it. The world is too much with us late and soon. Getting and spending, we lay waste our powers. You know, little we see in nature that is ours. And we would just repeat these lines through the entire poem. And they're beautiful. And then once they're in your, your memory and your imagination, that begins to change you, right? That, I think that's part of that process of, of developing the wonder and mystery of, of God's creation mm -hmm. and appreciating it and Please don't take me wrong here. I mean, obviously, the scriptures are beautiful, but human beings over the ages have, have written and expressed, you know, those manifestations of God's beauty in so many beautiful ways. And we, we need to embrace that, right? And, yeah. and I think that's what these three professors did in a very secular environment. And once it's in your memory, you, you never forget it, right? I, just, I memorized that poem yeah. probably 40 years ago. And I still have, I don't know if I could do the whole thing, but I could, yeah. um, you know, I can certainly do parts of it. And I, that's, that's what needs to be in, in our minds. That needs to be part of who we are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, it makes me think, you know, I think one of the unique things about being Catholic, mm -hmm. you know, Catholic meaning universal. Yes. There's mm -hmm. this ability of Catholicism as a, as a, a religion, a theology, mm -hmm. a philosophy, a worldview. Mm -hmm. It can embrace truth, goodness, and beauty mm -hmm. wherever it finds it, like no other system can. Yes, you know, mm -hmm. and and so when someone has this awakening to truth, goodness, mm -hmm. and beauty, just this 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 aspect of reality, mm -hmm. you know, it <laughs> then the, a next step is then to recognize, mm -hmm. well, this is the system of thought mm -hmm. that explains that that has a place for that. Yes, you know, that has a context for understanding why the mm -hmm. world has this truth, goodness, and beauty. That's right. I, I love it. St. Paul he says, you know, the, the, the fullness of truth, you know, the fullness of faith is the Catholic faith. And I, it, it's so important, especially as I grow older, I see the wisdom 
of Holy Mother Church in, in so many different areas of life. Of, of You know, penance is good for us now than then. Like, Lent is really a powerful season. Yeah. Um, I know the first time I encountered it, you know, as a convert, I was like, oh, you know, I'm not... And of course, I'm a young Catholic, right? I'm 20 years old, and I'm 21, and I'm, I don't want to give up anything. <laughs> Come on. That's not going to do me any good. You know, I'm just a little skeptical, right? And, uh, you know, you, begin, you, you just begin to see the wisdom of the, of the church in, in so many um, things that are, that are having an ill effect on our society right now. If, if, if our culture and society would at least listen to what the church says on, on many of these topics— about how we should conduct our lives and, and, and the importance of this, uh, because the church is, is so international. We, we were talking about this earlier on the way over here, that you walk into a Catholic church, and what do you see? You, you see people from every race, ethnicity, socioeconomic background. Every stage of the journey of faith. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it, it's real, right? It's That's... This represents the real world. This is reality. And I think that's one of those things that the concepts that the Catholic Church always holds up to us is yeah. reality. Yes. And reality can be beautiful, mm -hmm. and it can be not very pretty sometimes. Right? Yeah. And, and yet we have to encounter that reality because at least the beautiful parts of it, when mankind hasn't you know, messed it up somehow, uh, certainly reflects God's you know, yeah. beauty and glory. Yeah, that's that's this bold claim that we might make on mm -hmm. behalf of the yes. church, that the church mm -hmm. is always about reality. It is. And about trying mm -hmm. to approach reality. You mm -hmm. know, and, and again, reality is messy and the church is messy mm -hmm. and there's all kinds of caveats yes. we can make, but yes. it comes down to it. That's for a truth seeker out there. We would make mm -hmm. that bold claim that you're not going to find an institution, you no. know, that's more about reality and, mm -hmm. and approaching reality. Correct. Church. Yeah. And I think just, you know, in the day to day things, you know, of, of daily prayer and, and ordering, ordering your day to something, yeah. um, and even outside of yourself. And, and I know other churches, to certain degrees will, you know, have the same ideas and so forth. But, uh, I think that the Catholic church does it so well and, uh, and so deeply, I'm, I'm just amazed that I've been a, I'm coming up on 50 years as a convert, and I don't feel like I know anything. <laughs> you know, the depths, the riches of our faith are so profound I, that I, I just feel like I'm, I'm always learning, and, yeah. and I'm thankful to God for that. I, I think He's obviously He's infinite and we're finite, so we're never going to plumb the depths of God Himself, right? But. Um, what, what a magnificent, uh, I think it was Chesterton said, what a, what a magnificent adventure it is. Mm -hmm. I mean, life should be an adventure, even with its, its difficult moments. I've, um, and you know, I think we all have those, and, and God allows those to happen so we, we can work through them. Um, our second child, our, our oldest son, was um, born premature. He weighed three pounds, and you know I could hold him in the palm of my hand. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, I mean, fortunately that he was living, but unfortunately that he was three pounds, mm -hmm. um, and he had to have four hours of surgery, um, just an hour after he was born. Wow! And uh, you know, obviously we we had him baptized before the surgery, and got everybody praying, everybody we knew anyway, you know, praying for him. He had about a 50-50 chance, you know, making it through the surgery. But but he did. And, you know, I think you, you take those moments. They were very painful moments. Um, just, you know, so, so much. Yeah. You're just so anxious, you know, for for your son, in this case, our son. And, and uh, um, fortunately, you know, he survived the surgery. And he, but he had a lot of trouble afterwards. He's been in the hospital for years. Um, and had a lot of you know side effects from all that, but um, I think it, 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 either it brings you closer or or not. Yeah. If you remain open to reality, that's right. correct. Right, and that's the reality of that that particular yeah. situation. Now he's, he's he's a good, healthy 
strapping young man now, so <laughs> he's he's doing he's doing well. Um, but you know, I think we we have those moments in in life, and I think that you know another thing that happened to me in college was I was diagnosed that I had a, a kidney issue that had to be operated on this summer, and so. Um, I went in for the surgery one summer. This is in Kansas, you know, it's Tornado Alley. Yeah. And it was the old hospital there, and I'm up on the third floor one night, and I'm all wired up. I, I'd like literally been cut in half of this, because in those days, they they made bigger incisions <laughs> in those days. They didn't have the laparoscopic tools they have today. Right. And so I'm all wired up on this stuff, and, and these nurses come in, and uh, they say, well, we got a wee out in the hallway. I'm like, what's going on? And one of them said, well, there's a tornado right outside of town. Oh, wow. So it was coming right for the hospital. And I'm like, I can't move. <laughs> but you know what occurred to me uh, after it was over? I pretty much had to stay, right? I mean, you couldn't even get me out. I'd yeah. be afraid of going to get me out of the hospital. Um, I realized as I matured, who were the real sort of heroes or heroines at that point? It was the nurses that stayed with me. I had no choice, really, but to yeah. be there. But they could have, I theoretically left. Right, right. Come out of here. <laughs> um, you know, but they didn't. They stayed, and I think that was a, it was a wake-up call for me mm -hmm. in a lot of ways, personally. But I also think it was a, a very one of those sort of maturing moments where you begin to really see uh, certain people in your life make huge sacrifices yeah. for you. Right, and I think you know, of course, we saw this little begin with COVID. You know, they come forward a number yeah. of a couple of decades, and we have the COVID issue, and you know, those people that that really, you know, went that extra mile and put themselves in harm's way. So, I think God sends us these moments to to kind of wake up. That's that's yeah. one of the two by fours I mentioned earlier, <laughs> right, right, John Mark, that I needed. Um, yeah, you know, besides the, some of the more beautiful moments in my conversion. But, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, yeah. thanks be to God. Amen. Well, let's, mm -hmm. let's take a little break there. Uh, we've, we've jumped around a little bit. When we mm -hmm. come back, I want to go back just briefly to that, mm -hmm. that off-campus class. Again, you'd had this awakening mm -hmm. to truth, goodness, and beauty through this mm -hmm. interesting program, these professors. Mm -hmm. And I just want to know, so what were some of the things that you encountered in that class okay. you mm -hmm. know, that, uh, that continued this journey in you? And then we'll, and then we'll get back into the into the narrative and, and see what happened after you became Catholic and what's okay. happened since then. Okay, so, great. We'll be back in just a minute to hear the rest of David's mm -hmm. story. Uh, mm -hmm. And I want to remind you that if you are on a journey to the Catholic Church or if you're just asking questions, we'd love to be praying for you and with you on your journey. So if you check out chnetwork.org, we've got a newsletter, we've got an online community, as well as staff members who'd love to just share their story with you and hear yours and again, be praying for you and answering any questions that you have. So check out chnetwork.org and share a bit of your story with us. We'll be back in just a couple minutes to hear the rest of David Dean's story. See you then. Well, welcome back to the Journey Home program. We're entering the second half of our hour tonight speaking with David Dean, he's a former Presbyterian, superintendent of Catholic Schools, Diocese of Tulsa. Uh, that website is dioceseoftulsa.org. Uh, and David, you know, we, you've been sharing your story with us, and you went through that mm -hmm. legendary program mm -hmm. there at, at the university. And um, we talked just before the break a bit about, you know, what these three professors mm -hmm. uh, at, at Kansas, um, Kansas University, mm -hmm. um, you know, kind of what they'd... Uh, you know, the fire that they lit in you, this, mm -hmm. this awakening to truth, goodness, and beauty, and, and you went and asked that question, like, what's, what's going on here? And you discovered they're Catholic. Mm -hmm. And then you had this great experience of this off-campus program. And one of the things I, I mm -hmm. wanted to ask you about that, what were, you as you're learning about the Catholic faith, mm -hmm. what were some things that you encountered in that class or in those discussions that were particularly uh, surprising or interesting or, or uh, changing to you? I would say, first of all, just... Uh, you know, St. Paul says, right, that the height, the breadth, the depth. Yeah. Um, this time about the Catholic Church yeah. uh, that that I learned. I, I had no concept of 
even the church, you know, going back to being, you know, the time of Christ, you know, the apostolic age and the church yeah. fathers and all this history, because I think, you know, being reared as a Presbyterian, uh, my religious historical experience was, you know, Reformation forward right to now. Uh, again, not, I don't think in any angry or unkind way of, of ign David ignore all that, you know, the first 1500 years right. or, or even back, you know. Um, none of that, but to find out all this rich history and, and you know, tying, of course, back to Scripture and and the church fathers became, um, became so excited about them. Um, I've always had this love affair with St. Augustine because I think that um, my early college days resembled somewhat his days, you know, in, yeah. in Carthage or early days in Milan, um, you know, before his conversion. Um, I didn't have any children that way, the way he did, but I, I you know, I led a similar lifestyle in many ways. And yes. so as I learned all these uh, uh, just incredible things about the church, uh, I, I thought, of course, it just really, you know, pulled me in. Um, but there's always that moment, and I know others have, have written about this, that how many people who are interested in the church come right to the door and then they don't come in. Mm -hmm. You know, that sort of act of free will to say, okay, Lord, I see it. It's, it's beautiful. It, you know, it's had its bad moments like any institution that's comprised of human beings. But overall, it's a pretty glorious history um, am I going to take that step? You know, and I already alluded to earlier, I, I had such respect for my father. I, I fought with that a little bit, mm -hmm. uh, you know, internally. Um, but I would say those classes, and to see, as I said, a couple dozen other young students like myself, you know, probing, asking the questions. Mm -hmm. what, what is our purpose in this life? And where can we best find you know that which is going to meet yes our you know our, our heart's desire yes um you know again augustine <laughs> you know our, our hearts are restless until they rest in thee and, yeah. and uh, that sentiment and i think it ran through a lot of these young people and i would say i it's hard for me to remember that far back exactly but i i would assume that probably maybe half of those two dozen or so young people that were there at least a half or half of them probably came into the church. But what was interesting about the program as well was that those that did not enter the church, they became stronger in their own church. Mm -hmm. In other words, I mm -hmm. think in some mysterious way that only you know God can probably explain that they became stronger, you know, as a Baptist or a Methodist or Episcopalian or you know whatever church they attended, um, because not everyone converted, obviously. Um, but I, but I think. You know, that program and in these classes brought them to a point of a deeper love of Christ as well. And, uh, yeah. and then uh, what flowed from that, of course, is we had, uh, you know, Bishop Connolly and Lincoln as a convert, um, went through the program and Archbishop Coakley in Oklahoma City. Yeah, um, it's become sort of legendary since then. Yes, you know. and then the Clear Creek Monastery, which is now... right. There were about, I think, six or seven uh, young men who um, originally went to Fon Combo, France, and had been in the monastery there. Um, I was actually privileged enough when they when they moved to the States uh, to set up in, outside of Tulsa, where they are currently. Um, I met them at the airport and said, DFW. Wow. So they, they got a lot of funny looks. Yeah. <laughs> they were Benedictine robes on and, and uh, standing right. around. And of course, most of them were speaking French because even the Americans, um, having spent 20 years or so, you know, in France, where French had almost become their native tongue. And yeah. um, and there have been some others, uh, you know, other young men that became priests, uh, joined different orders and so forth. Uh, a young one of the young ladies in the program, I think, is an abbess of a Benedictine wow. monastery over in Europe. I think in France. Wow, I'm not sure, but many, many uh, convert probably hundreds of conversions, literally, out of this program over a maybe ten or fifteen year time frame. So it was a real grace within the church, uh, I, I believe. Uh, yeah, 
that um, it was, I mean, who would have thought it? I, there's an interesting thing I, I discovered not too long ago was that if you go look at the, the seal, the University of Kansas, you won't mm -hmm. believe this. <laughs> but guess what it is? It's, it's a sort of kind of beautiful rendering of Moses the burning bush. And it's not being consumed. And of course, later as I read some of the saints' commentaries on that, that it caused wonder. It's, he's kneeling before, you know, all the more famous uh, artwork surrounding that scene. He's kneeling before the bush. Why, why is it not being consumed? And it turns out that it was an Anglican minister back in 1865 who actually started the university right after the war wow. civil war and that's what he chose and i thought you know how appropriate because you know back to what i was saying earlier i think what those three professors did was instill in us that sense of wonder right to look beyond you know and even in another sense than the other way to look deeper in you know to our own hearts yeah. and to look and look at reality and kind of bounce that back and forth a little bit in our yeah. own experience and so um i've often wondered so maybe you know god's mysterious plan and things yeah uh, 100 <laughs> no true accident 60 yeah. years later and whatever that is i'd do the math That's but uh, yeah maybe not quite that long but yeah it's it's really incredible uh so yeah it was um and I, and I, yeah. No, so you I mean you had that encounter, and then you you entered the church mm -hmm. after that. And so what happened after that? Um, well, uh, one of the things the professors talked about was when we graduated, uh, they would say things like, "What you really should do is just go home and try to make your own hometown community a better place. Right? Be a good witness to Christ mm -hmm. in your home, your hometown." Well, I was from this little town, Hutchison, Kansas. The dubious distinction of having one of the world's longest grain elevators. <laughs> uh, so I went home and I, I taught uh, at a little Catholic high school there for a couple years. Uh, and then Dr. Senior called me one day and said, well, I'd like to go back to study in her room and get my master's in classics or Latin. And of course I said yes. Uh, and so I went back and, and did that for four years. I actually started on a doctorate. And, but uh, most importantly, I met my, my lovely wife there. Um, who had been through the program, and she's also a convert, but from a very strong evangelical background. Uh, she was one of those people who would, would go down to the beaches in Florida and talk to you about Jesus while uh, you had a beer in your hand. <laughs> uh, but a wonderful person, and uh, we just celebrated our 40th wedding anniversary. Oh, congratulations. Just That's awesome. a couple of few weeks ago. So uh, we, uh, so she, as I said, she came into the church, and. I did, I did uh, stop teaching the church for a while, though, because this is our family grew. I, as, as a Catholic school teacher, I just couldn't afford it anymore. And so I got in the business world for a little while, an actual consultant, and then um, set, helped set up the retirement plan for the Diocese of Wichita. I met the superintendent there, and he kept trying to pull me back in, but I would given the money was a problem. And then, you know, God, God provided again. Um, my first principal's job was out in Gallup, New Mexico, which is... A, Missionary Diocese. Um, someone had gotten my name from Dr. Quinn, who was one of the professors in the program. And so Laura and I prayed about it because we were in Wichita, which is where her family's from, is where she grew up. And that was, that was a long ways away, and we went out, and it was, it was a great experience. The, the student population was one, about one third Navajo, mm -hmm. and then uh, one third Hispanic or Latino, and then about one third Anglo, and uh, you know, very sadly, very impoverished area. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were able to kind of save the school there. It's proud to say it's still going nice. many years later. And then um, without going into the details, I, I, then we moved to Dallas-Fort Worth area. And um, I was ahead of a couple different schools there. And uh, the, uh, I think it, you know, back to this reality question a little bit, mm -hmm. um, I'd really encourage young parents today is to you know, immerse their children in reality as much as they can. I, 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 I know there's sort of this movement back to the land, mm -hmm. and I know a lot of people where we live, and maybe this is you know, easier in the Midwest or, or in Oklahoma where I live, but 
uh, I knew some families in Phoenix, actually. Um, I mean, in Phoenix, they get some chickens. I mean, <laughs> get, get, I, <laughs> grow some vegetables, right? I mean, go out and, and you know, put your hands in the dirt and, and try to grow a tomato plant. Now they won't do well in Phoenix, of course, they'll all burn up. But uh, <laughs> that's a good thing to learn, too. Mm -hmm. right? um, or, or maybe your chickens are kind of messy. But um, this, this immersion into reality of, of um, I think it's so important um, for young people today because mm -hmm. of the our handheld devices and the technology and so forth is yeah. that to get them into that. So um, yeah, I've spent my uh, entire, pretty much my entire adult life in education, uh, mostly Catholic education. And I, I'm very pleased to see this movement within the church now and education back to these sort of things. That's why I brought up the this kind of back to re, you know reality type yeah. education. It's it's um, as much as I love my academic preparation at KU. Um, I think it's just as important that as part of a good Catholic education um, that we get out. Um, you know, we, we do some things to help the poor. Mm -hmm. We have an incredible um, Catholic charities in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Um, well, we have a wonderful bishop too, Bishop Condola. Has always been so supportive of our schools there, and a, a lot of good you know, priests and clergy and religious. But um, get out and do some of these things, right? Uh, education's not just academic, um, and if you if you have the capability, a little backyard or something, do something you know, natural. Go, yeah. go get your hands dirty. You know, dig around in the mud and plant something. Um, and just have that experience. Uh, for our young people, I think they desperately need that that constant touch with reality. Mm -hmm. And so I, I'm I'm very pleased in in the Catholic education world to see this kind of coming to the fore. I think more and more um, that um, even to the point that maybe not all my children should go to college. Mm. Right? Maybe one or two of my children would be better off learning a more manual type trade or labor of some sort, and that might even be computers or whatever, but um, that might be woodworking. You know, Bishop Condrell in Tulsa is a magnificent woodworker. Um, he's our bishop. Yeah. Right? Um, kind of fits with the St. Joseph theme, I think. For sure. <laughs> the carpenter, right? So I think, again, you know, when we talk about the expansiveness and the depth and breadth of the church, I believe Catholic education should reflect that. Yeah, and maybe not all our kids need to go to college or Harvard. You know those sort of things we always talk about. Maybe they'd be better off being a carpenter. Well, education mm -hmm. sometimes we reduce it right to simply mm -hmm. a transfer of information. Correct. Mm -hmm. But it's you know classically we would mm -hmm. recognize it as a, it's a formation in virtue, which means yes. not just intellectual habits, mm -hmm. not just external appearances, but habits mm -hmm. of soul. Mm -hmm. Right, and that's one of the reasons why you can't dispense from uh, an encounter with reality. Mm -hmm. is that it's when you come up against reality mm -hmm. that then you have to make choices about it. You have mm -hmm. to choose how to regard it. You have to wrestle with it. And it's mm -hmm. that wrestling, it's those decisions that you make. Yes. Mm -hmm. where you're practicing these habits of soul, you know, these Correct. virtues. Uh, and so you can have a good, infor a good informational education. Mm -hmm. You can get a lot of head knowledge, mm -hmm. but it has to train you in wonder, it has to train you in truth seeking, it has mm -hmm. to train you in those habits of, of soul. That's you know? correct. You know, I think one of the beauties too of the, of the program that we did, and I, we've tried to do this with young adults. Um, my wife is, was, has been very involved in a uh, Catholic youth group. She has this just wonderful effervescence personality. She's perfect, <laughs> you know, work around youth, and she's been a DRE of a couple different parishes. Yeah. And so amongst all the other things we do, like camp outs and so forth, when, when we would do one of those, we would go out and, and we just look at the stars, and you tell the stories of the constellations, the mythology of it. Again, that that story is that very poetic. And if you ever go out where you don't have the ambient light of a city mm -hmm. in the country somewhere, and you look at the stars, and you you can see the pattern of the Milky Way, and, and the stars really do glisten. You know, I I, I always remind people of the. The nursery rhyme we all learned when we were very young, you know, uh, twinkle, twinkle, little star. You know, there's so much truth right there. Yeah. 
stars do twinkle. They really do. And the next line is how I wonder what you are. What, what a beautiful, what a poetic experience to go out and just sit under the stars. And maybe you're, if you're really good at, you know, your uh, constellations, you know, maybe you'll pick out Orion or Andromeda or, you know, or the, the big bear, the little bear, you know, the, the all those kind of uh, different constellations. But just, you know, sit or lie there on the ground and look up. Yeah. You know, look up and wonder at, did that just really come from a pool of mud? Right? You know, some will propose or a big bang or something like that. Um, if you can't see, you know, God's handiwork and design in that, then you got a lot of work to do. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's, it's, um, it should just absolutely stir you right to the core and to, to, to see that, that beauty, you know, of, of God's creation. Because yeah. then you, then we are like, you know, Robert Frostbaum, I think it is, you know, we choose something like a star, you know, to be stayed on. And that's really true. You know, sailors use the North Star, you know, to navigate. Um, so, behind the star who who is that you know what there, there again my analogy earlier about the body yeah. right it has a purpose doesn't it yeah and what is that purpose and who's behind it so i think this is really where we need to go you know with back to catholic education again well mm -hmm. i think all education but i'm most concerned about catholic education yeah. in my life but I, I want children as much as possible to, to have that immersion into reality and into you know really just Set aside for for young children. Let's cultivate that imagination because I do think, mm -hmm. then properly cultivated, it does lead to virtue. Yeah, and as you know, virtue is a strength. Mm -hmm. Even the etymology of the word mm -hmm. um, is, is is strength. And so, uh, don't our young people need that today? Yeah, you know, in our the culture wars we fight, we need the young people who are immersed in reality, and are oriented toward virtue and the virtuous life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you know that we we live a, often a mediated reality, right? Where it's, mm -hmm. our reality is mediated by technology mm -hmm. or different things like that. But then also intellectually too, we, like we we don't recognize sometimes till later the absorbed worldviews mm -hmm. that sort of mediate our experience of reality. You know, mm -hmm. and as Catholics, we you've been describing, you know, we, this sort mm -hmm. of sacramental worldview, mm -hmm. right? Where right. things are, are meaningful, they're purposeful, they have mm -hmm. a telos, they. Mm -hmm. They're sort of just charged with beauty, you know, even the the great myths and mythologies of the world, mm -hmm. you know, they, they all bespeak, again, what's what's behind it. Everything's mm -hmm. sort of a, a sign yeah. and symbol of pointing behind it. And it's in Catholicism that you find a, a theology that mm -hmm. that embraces that and that also brings you to the myth mm -hmm. made real, you know, Correct. in the That's gospel mm -hmm. and in the sacraments. I mean, talk, about, if you would, for a moment, we have about seven minutes left. Okay. Um, we didn't really touch mm -hmm. on the sacraments because... We, we talked about, we've sort of been talking mm -hmm. around this sacramental worldview. What, mm -hmm. what has been your experience coming from your background as a Presbyterian to this, the sacraments of the Catholic Church? How, mm -hmm. how were, were those significant to you? That's a great question because I, I think that was, in my early conversion time, that was mm -hmm. really one of the things I struggled with. Mm -hmm. Um, now, the Eucharist was easy because you go to John 6, right, you know, verses 50, 55, and... I'd not read that before, you know, I mean, back before I converted, but <laughs> I was... Put that in there. Yeah, like, wow, well, wait a minute, <laughs> Kathy was a slip that in there. I go back and read my Protestant Bible. But, um, no, but so that that wasn't so difficult. Sure. But I think, you know, I think for like a lot of people, you know, confession yeah. and um, sort of, you know, the guarantee of that absolution um, in a sacramental way was, was difficult for me um, initially. And I think like a lot of people, I, I still have a... A little discomfort, you know, going in. It's, it's still hard to um, kind of humble yourself before our Lord and mm -hmm. say, well, uh, as I was saying to you earlier, uh, Lord, here I am again. Yeah, uh, you know, that's right. I've done this again. <laughs> uh, you know, said this, or thought that, you know, and so yeah. forth. And, and um, you know, I'm thinking, well, God, God really is merciful and patient, at least with me. Um, so, you know, it... But as I grew into that, and I and I think it is, isn't it? As a convert, aren't we like little plants? 
right? That, you know, God is planted on this earth and uh, he waters us with the sacraments. And then if, if, if we agree, so to speak, you know, our free will is yeah. compliant. Step step. Just little steps, yeah. You know, we grow and we flourish, you know, and then, of mm -hmm. course, the, sort of the top of that is are the saints, mm -hmm. right? And um, I think that notion then that came along with it that I'd never thought about before was, at the time, was um, the more I diminish, then the more he increases. Mm -hmm. And but. That's a good thing, not a bad yes, thing. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> and this time I was like, well, wait a minute. You know, <laughs> pride, you know, swells up. And, and um, so, I, yeah, the sacramental theology for me was, and just, and even, of course, the actual real participation in those sacraments. And as I told you at the start, the, the first time I walked in a Catholic church, I was like, I'm not putting my finger in that water. You know, I don't know if it was. <laughs> and now, I see it and I experience it as something very real and I mm -hmm. understand it as a sacramental and, and um, how tangible our faith is. And again, back to kind of the topic we, you know, today is that how real that is. Yeah. You know, and, and, and the bread, you know, becoming the body and the, you know, the wine, the blood and the true presence and how real all these, these things are yeah. um, in, in the church. And it just... I love it. I mean, it's just it's just taken me decades to yeah to even try to get a little bit you know yeah. a little bit of it. Of, well, of there mystery. is a real scandal there because mm -hmm. in some sense it's almost it's easier to approach God's majesty and transcendence, right? Mm -hmm. You encounter the beauty, and truth, yes. and goodness of the world, and, it's like, mm -hmm. and so you can grapple with that. But then it's like it's another step layer of the journey for God to say, okay, yeah, but what if I got right up close. <laughs> yes. <laughs> what if I got scandalously close to my people, you know, yes. as a, as as a man in you know in the form of bread and wine in mm -hmm. baptism in in these these places of encounter. Yes. That's scandalous because yeah. in some sense we want a god that's sort of big and beautiful and out there. Yes. But when he comes up close, then mm. that's a bit of a it's a it's a growth. It's a moment of real growth. Right. And we want him to take care of everything, right? right. Yeah. Now we can kind of sit back and say, good job, God. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then you learn, well, wait a minute. You know, I'm an instrument. Yeah. And I have to do as much as I can, you know, within the context of my vocation and so mm -hmm. forth. But, um, yeah, that's, uh, that. I think that was just one of the great, great mysteries of the church that mm -hmm. really moved me, you know, in, in my conversion. But it did take me, as I said, some time to work through some of those concepts of the different sacraments and, and why why are they important? Why, you know, the, the Protestant, right? Why, why can't I just pray and ask forgiveness and yeah. those sort of things? Right. Yeah. But uh, the uh, but it's been uh, it's been a wonderful journey. I guess it's, you know, as the show suggests, coming home. Yeah, and continuing uh, on. Right. The journey yes. doesn't that doesn't end. That's another piece of this too. There's that's, always that's right. A little bit more. Yeah. Yeah. It's um. It's it, it's, um, I just would, again, encourage people to, um, you know, this, this courage, you know, the word encourage um, actually comes from a lot of the, that core part, it means our heart. Mm -hmm. um, and so we, we need to be courageous of heart, right? Great, so have great, strong hearts um, for Christ. And, and um, I think, you know, we'll be wounded along the way. Um, we've been talking about all these wonderful things, mm -hmm. but one maybe final thing is that um, we are wounded in our own ways, uh, and we're wounded by others. And I was reading this, this beautiful passage um, with this group I'm, we're reading Latin together, it was from St. Thomas, it just it was providential I came across it, but um, it was a part on Christ's resurrection, and he says that Christ will bear the wounds. We'll see his wounds in heaven. Mm. And St. Thomas says how appropriate that is because those wounds reflect virtue and they reflect his glory. Mm. In rather intimidating manner, he says, they also will be the proof for those that didn't believe. Mm. And that we need to, and a lot of the saints have said this, when it tough, when things really get tough, we need to go hide in those, so to speak, in those wounds, or rest, maybe is a better word, yeah. in those wounds, and take our wounds to his wounds. Um, and 
that is a great you know grace that Christ can give us. It's one of the effects of his uh, you know crucifixion and then his resurrection. But I that really struck me one day when I had to come across that about how important it is to manifest those, work through them, use God, yeah, grace, rely on his strength, give it up to him, everybody, just Amen. give it up to him, let him do the best you all can, like we all do, and give it to him, and know that, you know, he died for us, and that's, that is our, that's back to St. Augustine, that's where our hearts are going to finally rest, and rest, you know, within his heart, and uh, and until we do that, we will we won't be completely happy, right? Or, Amen. Hmm. Well, David, thanks so much for sharing your story. Sure. And Thank that, you for having me on. A great parting image there yes. again. Yeah, just, uh, turning to that reality. It's, mm -hmm. a, it's a difficult reality. That's why Catholics keep the crucifix up. That's correct. Because mm -hmm. uh, we want to flee to that reality of God's infinite love, His, infinite his humble love, love, you know, coming to be close to us in the suffering. Mm -hmm. So, yes. Thank you well, so thank much. You. Okay, so go ahead. Yeah. No, well, thank you for having me on. Yeah. And uh, keep praying for all the good work you're doing here. Thank you. And uh, I know Marcus in the beginning and all, and now you. And I hope God uh, showers many great blessings on thank you, you all. Thank you, David. And we'll be praying for you and your, and your work at, uh, there in the uh, Diocese of Tulsa mm -hmm. and all the Catholic schools there, all the Catholic educators mm -hmm. and all the students. Mm -hmm. We're keeping them in prayer. So yeah, thank you for you. joining us for this episode <laughs> of the Journey Home Program. <laughs> I pray that uh, David's story was an inspiration to you. We'll be back again next week with another story. God bless you until then. See you. Mm -hmm.